Welcome to another snapshot version and this one is dedicated to transaction cycles. Now this snapshot is quite unique in the sense that even if you scour through my entire YouTube channel, you will not be able, able to find a more detailed lecture on this one, mainly because transaction cycles are actually in the jurisdiction of audit practice or audit problems. However, we are momentarily borrowing these concepts to our channel right now because this will help us better appreciate multiple choice questions or questions relating to controls testing and even substantive testing. Allow me to also tell you that approaching the audit from the transaction cycle approach is just one of the many ways by which an auditor may segment or divide an audit. Other ways of segmenting the audit may be done via FS line items or even via account titles. But the transaction cycle approach is one of the more popular ways to segment or divide the audit. So let us start by appreciating the interrelatedness of these transaction cycles and, and I invite you to answer the question if we were to open a business if you are a business that is just about to be given birth to what do you think will you need and I think in unison we will all say of course cash and once we need cash in order to give birth to the business then we actually activate what we know of to be the capital acquisition and repayment cycle actually the capital acquisition and repayment cycle is where we will get to see the basic accounting equation in full action. The basic accounting equation would simply be assets equal liabilities plus equity, right? Thereby, whenever we need to raise cash, we need to either get it from internal sources, from equity, or from external sources coming from long-term debt. So this cycle represents how the business raises funds at the birth of the business, either from long-term debt or from equity. And then we get to ask the question, the moment we have cash, what do you think will we do next? What is our favorite activity once we have cash? And perhaps we'll also all say, well, we will go shopping, especially for the ladies. You will resonate with this one, yeah? So once we have cash, once the business has cash, then the business will go shopping. The business will, of course, purchase materials, purchase inventory for resale, purchase supplies, will pay off rent, utilities, name it, those things happen under the acquisition and payment cycle. And because no man is an island, no business is an island either, we would need people to help us out. And so therefore, the payroll and personal cycle will then be activated. And for those of you who are fans of cost accounting, I think you can guess what will happen next. We have material we have labor and because of that we will then activate the inventory and warehousing cycle where we will convert from raw materials to work in process and finally to finish goods and the moment we have finished goods it will happen next of course the business can now start selling right and when the business is able to sell these finished goods the business can then collect as well either from cash sales or from collections of receivables and these collections will eventually lead us back to cash and the moment that the business has cash again what will we do next and then for most of us we might say go shopping again but this time nope not to go shopping again just yet we will have to make sure that we repay right that's why it's called capital acquisition and repayment cycle so from here you get to see the interrelatedness and the interconnectedness of the different transaction cycles notice the very unique placement of the inventory and warehousing cycle it doesn't have any direct interaction or any direct relation to cash as it does have to wait for materials to come in and labor to come in before we can start converting our raw materials into finished goods notice as well that all of these cycles actually have common accounts that are that we get to observe within these cycles let's say for example as what we have mentioned capital acquisition we talk about long-term debt we talk about equity and of course there's always cash acquisition and payment we talk about accounts payable accrued liability purchases 
and then of course cash okay and then even the purchase of non-current assets like your ppe might come into play here for payroll and personnel we talk about salaries and wages we talk about the mandatory deductions and then of course we also talk about cash inventory and warehousing we talk about your inventories raw materials work in process finished goods and sales and collection of course is where we'll get to see the interplay of sales and accounts receivable and the entirety of the sales family so from here we could already see that there is no distinct beginning nor end there is no particular transaction cycle that would signal a distinct beginning or end of the cycles of the business unless we talk about the birth meaning at the very start of the business and the death meaning at the very end of the business only then can we clearly see a distinct beginning and end but throughout the entirety of the life of the business these cycles will interact with each other vibrantly dynamically and seamlessly so these are the common transaction cycles in a business. What we're going to do next is to take a look at each of these cycles and basically just point out what are its salient features. Let's start with sales and collection. So if we go through the CPA licensure exam syllabus in the Philippines, the sales and collection cycle is actually referred to as order to cash. So whenever you encounter the phrase order to cash, that refers to the sales and collection cycle. However, in most literature, this was actually called the revenue and receipt cycle. Revenue, of course, referring to how goods and services are sold to customers in exchange for future promises to pay, and and receipt would, of course, refer to cash collected from customers. Now, whenever we encounter questions relating to these transaction cycles, it's important for us to call to mind what is the story behind this particular cycle. And if we look at the revenue and receipt cycle, when we open the storybook to this one, it's once upon a time, once upon a time, <laughs> it's once upon a time will be with the presence of a customer order. So it is not enough for us to be able to identify, when I say us this time, I mean the business, it's not enough for the business to be able to identify a potential customer that's not going to start the story, that's not going to be our once upon a time, but it is necessary for that customer to actually place an order. Okay, once the customer places an order, then the sales and collection cycle becomes alive. <laughs> okay, it becomes triggered into action. Now, this, the customer order that is being received by the business will then, of course, have to be evaluated by the business if they still have enough stocks or inventory in order to meet that order. So the business will determine if it can meet the customer order. If it does or if it can, then the business will convert this customer order in what we call a sales order. So the sales order has to be pre-numbered and it has to be properly authorized. Okay. Now the pre-numbering of the sales order helps the business to determine that all orders have been eventually delivered. That's the purpose of the pre-numbering. And then prior Year two, formalizing the customer order to a sales order, there has to be an appropriate credit approval process. Businesses just don't allow any and all types of customers to transact with them in credit, right? There has to be a proper credit approval process in order to ensure that there is a high likelihood of collecting from these customers. However, you may ask the question, what if upon evaluating the business finds out that they do not have enough stocks or enough inventory to serve what the customer needs at that certain point? Then in that case, the business will prepare what is called a backlog confirmation. So a backlog confirmation is kind of like telling the customer, customer, I'm so sorry, we don't have enough stocks yet, but maybe in two, three weeks time, if you're willing to wait. <laughs> okay, so so if there is no enough stock, then the, the business will come up with a backlog confirmation. But assuming there is enough inventory to make good the customer order. So after the customer order, there will be the sales order. And after the sales order, of course, the business will have to ship out what the customer actually ordered, right? So then we will get to see the shipping document, which some of us may know to be the bill of lading, but then the more generic term to that will be the shipping document. Now, as a good control, the shipping documents should only be prepared 
if there is the presence of a duly authorized sales order, this is to avoid instances whereby businesses are shipping out items which were not actually ordered by a customer. So prepare the shipping document only with an authorized sales order. And it is actually the shipping document that is sent to the billing department for invoice preparation. So the moment that the items have been shipped, okay, that we now have the shipping document, this particular shipping document will be sent to the billing department and the billing department will prepare the sales invoice. Needless to say, the sales invoice must also be pre-numbered, it must also be authorized, and the sales invoice can only be prepared if there is is a shipping document and this sales invoice is what is going to be sent to the accounting department for recording and here you will get to notice that the main purpose really of those in the accounting department will be to do the recording so the basis for the accounting department in recording the sale will be the sales invoice now because our customers or the businesses customers do not actually only have one transaction with the business for the entire month right it is possible for customers to have multiple transactions within the month and so the business will also send the customers a monthly statement detailing the unpaid balances for the month Okay, now when the customer pays, the customer also includes a customer remittance advice in order to alert the business as to what particular customer and invoice the payment is for. Now, because we're talking about sales, we have to talk about the entire sales family and the entire sales family does not only comprise sales, but also sales returns bad debts and including as well sales uh, returns and allowances and then of course the presence of write-offs so notice that all account titles related to these major business functions will go under the sales and collection cycle i would like to highlight the importance of the shipping document the sales invoice and the write-offs that does not mean that the other functions are not important they still are but then if you ever remember our discussion about completeness and occurrence for example so when we say completeness that all transactions that occurred have actually been recorded you'd be normally say we do this one or we test this one by looking at whether all shipping documents have eventually a related invoice prepared for it so the shipping document represents the actual sale the shipping uh, the sales invoice would represent the record made by the entity okay so if only these two documents are present in your multiple choice question then the shipping document represents the actual sales the sales invoice will get to represent the recorded sales so whenever you test for existence or occurrence and completeness, then these two documents normally appear in your multiple choice questions. Needless to say, of course, sometimes uh, questions may refer to the accounts receivable register or the listing of sales. So listing of sales, AR registers would also refer to the recording of the sales. Remember again that the sales invoice become the basis for recording the said sales. We also put a highlight to write-offs and how it is very important for there to be a proper segregation of duties in terms of write-offs of accounts receivable. Mainly because whenever we talk about write-offs, we do get to realize that sometimes if controls are not so good, then it may be possible for an employee who has received the money that has that actually represented a collection and then recorded it as a write-off so can you imagine if a customer comes in pays in cash then did not ask for a receipt and then the employee instead of debiting cash and crediting accounts receivable instead debited allowance for doubtful accounts and then credited accounts receivable in this case the customer will never know because the account balance of the customer will be both reduced to zero whether it was recorded as a collection or a write-off right so the problem then will be with the business because the business supposedly received cash but then that employee recorded a write-off instead so there should be proper segregation of duties and strong controls relating to the write-offs of receivables now in terms of the sales and collection cycle we also have to point out that there is a presumptive significant risk 
over revenue recognition. When we talk about presumptive significant risk over revenue recognition, the suspicion of the auditor is, or the risk that is being considered by the auditor is the risk of overstatement. Okay, so there's a presumptive significant risk of overstatement when it comes to revenues. Why? If you think about it, accounting for revenue recognition is not as simple as we would have loved it to be. Think about barters or exchanges. Think about revenues recognized using the percentage of completion method, which will, of course, involve some level of estimates. Think about online sales or think about advanced collection of revenue or sales. So these things all contribute contribute to the complex nature of revenue recognition and so therefore giving it the presumptive significant risk. Now, in case the auditor has decided that there is no significant risk over revenue recognition, the auditor must document the basis for him saying that there is no such significant risk. We also acknowledge that there are very pronounced fraud risk factors under revenue recognition. If you would recall the fraud risk factors, you will of course have in incentives or pressures to commit the fraud, you will have opportunities to commit the fraud, and then of course rationalization in committing the fraud, right? So these are just some of the fraudulent transactions that you may be able to encounter when you audit the revenue and receipt cycle, such as, for example, bill and hold. Bill and hold simply means that the company has already issued the invoice, but then the items are still in the warehouse. Now, we know in the accrual basis of accounting, we do recognize revenue the moment that there is transfer of ownership. The fact that the items are still in the warehouse simply means that no transfer of ownership has yet occurred and yet the business has already billed the customer by billing the customer meaning to say the business has prepared a sales invoice and remember the sales invoice becomes the basis for recording the sale for debiting AR and crediting sales so therefore bill and hold is one of the fraudulent transactions you may encounter in revenue and receipt cycle another is improper cutoff it's when businesses keep the books open uh, sometimes they do this one in case Cases whereby a quota or a target has not yet been met and they would normally keep the books open and that you know sales made in January of the next year will then be recorded in December of this year just so they can meet the quota and you know be eligible for the bonus so that is another fraudulent transaction another will be kickback sales if you think about commissions under the table transactions or overstated percentages of completion knowing of course that percentage of completion would require some sort of not really some sort of but would really require some level of estimation so overstated completion would also be a potential uh, fraudulent transaction or procedure under this cycle pre-invoicing pre-invoicing is when there are actually no sales but the business has already made the invoice maybe this is the business's way of manifesting right so no actual sales yet no orders yet and yet they have already prepared the invoice and again we understand the importance of the invoice the moment that an invoice is generated this is the signal to accounting to make the record to recognize sales right but in this case there was actually no sale because there was no actual order but the business still prepared the invoice or channel stuffing if you can imagine the channels of distribution uh, say for example from manufacturer to wholesaler to retailer to distributors channel stuffing would be like force feeding the channels of distribution even if they did not uh, order such or even when it is beyond their demand so it's force feeding them to buy the goods so that you know businesses can meet their quotas sales managers can have their bonuses and such so these are just some of the possible fraudulent transactions that you may encounter in the audit of the revenue and receipt cycle of course, we do have to mention the possibility of lapping. And if you're familiar with how lapping works, it's misapplying a particular, uh, it's misapplying a collection from a particular customer to another customer. So if you can imagine, for example, customer A got to pay his or her account, but then the personnel who received the collection wanted to go shopping and so decided to, you know, 
get away with the money and when shopping and when customer B paid then the payment of customer B was applied to customer A and then the payment of customer C was applied to customer B and so on. So lapping is another fraudulent transaction you may be able to see when you audit sales and collection cycle and unauthorized write-offs like the illustration we gave a while back recording a collection as a write-off instead. So these things are what make up or these business functions are what make up the sales and collection cycle otherwise called order to cash and these are some of the precautionary tales okay that we must be alert of in terms of auditing this cycle now whenever we talk about transaction cycles we always have to remember what are the management assertions and the audit objectives which we have reviewed in the immediate previous snapshot and we also have to recall control activities which we have reviewed in the snapshot for internal controls. So remember PIPs, performance review. So this is where the budgets, the variance, the quotas would come in. Information processing, this is where the pre-numbering would come in. This is where the proper authorization would come in. And then we also, of course, have uh, physical controls or physical locks where you, of course, restrict, for example, access to cash. And then segregation of duties, as what we have pointed out, different departments, different personnel will be in charge of different functions to ensure that not a single one of them will be able to commit fraud and get away with it unnoticed. So that is the sales and collection cycle. We will soon be moving on to the acquisition and payment cycle. However, it might make this snapshot too lengthy. And instead of a shot, it might seem like a full-blown cocktail. So we are going to momentarily stop here. And in the next snapshot, let's talk about acquisition and payment cycle as well as the inventory and warehousing cycle. So see you in the next snapshot as a continuation to our transaction cycle discussion.